good day everyone and welcome to our next lesson. In this video, we will be talking about water quality and water treatments. We will be talking extensively how do we take surface water, treat it, and distribute it such that the water coming out of our faucets is clean and safe. But to start, let's first review the hydrologic cycle or most commonly known as the water cycle. Water is constantly being transferred between the hydrosphere, atmosphere, and lithosphere, and it is important to imagine the magnitude of transfer of water because not all of this water that is transferred is useful to us. For example, majority of our water is actually in the form of salt water, which we cannot use for our everyday functions. If you compare the rates of water transfer here indicated in 10 raised to 12 cubic meters per year, or this is 10 gigatons of water per year, you can see that majority of the evaporation is coming from the ocean, but it also goes back to the ocean. The small portion of ocean evaporation that goes into precipitation on land combined with evapotranspiration is basically what we are using as our fresh water. Okay? Now, in terms of water distribution, you can see in this chart that salt water makes up about 97% of the total water on Earth. So basically, that is 97% of the total water of Earth that we cannot directly use. It needs further treatment before we can use it. And the remaining 3% is the fresh water of Earth, and that is further divided into 68.7% that is being trapped, frozen in ice caps and glaciers. The remaining 30.1% is trapped in groundwater and needs further extraction. The surface water that we know as the lakes, rivers, and ponds make up only about 0.3% of the total fresh water of Earth. And of that 0.3%, 87% of the fresh water is in lakes, 11% are in swamps, and 2% are in rivers. So with this understanding of the distribution of water on Earth, it puts into perspective our use of water. So if you are used to wasting water coming from your faucet just because it's cheap and because it's readily available to us, always think that our water resources are actually finite and we may run out of it sooner than later. In Metro Manila, majority of the water coming out of the faucet is actually coming from the Angat Dam. And we are actually fortunate in the Philippines because we are blessed with a lot of surface water resources. In some countries, they have to rely on groundwater. And in some countries, such as countries in the Middle East, they have to rely on the desalination of salt water just to obtain fresh water. So count this as one of our blessings that we are abundant in surface water. But let's now make the distinction between surface water and groundwater. Groundwater, from the name itself, is water extracted from the ground. And in the Philippines, it is often found in rural areas that are out of reach of commercial water services. Basically, if a place contains groundwater, that means that they will be self-reliant on their water needs because you can just extract groundwater on site. In some places, it would be necessary for water concessionaires to utilize groundwater, especially if surface water sources have dried up or are very polluted. Let's try to differentiate surface water and groundwater based on different attributes such as availability, pollution, components, and treatment. What we will be discussing later on in our lesson is the treatment of water itself, but we will not make the distinction between surface and groundwater because the same treatment applies to both. However, they might have different components that would require a different type of treatment. Let's first go through their availability. Surface water and groundwater both have localized availability because they are not available in all places. While surface water is easier to spot because it is just on the surface, sometimes groundwater sources can be more reliable than surface water sources. Groundwater remains as a crucial resource for many rural areas of the Philippines and even in some areas in the highly urbanized Metro Manila. That's because groundwater is more stable and is readily available provided that you already have a drilled well. Okay. However, surface water is much more advantageous if you are supplying a large population such as for water concessionaires because the supply of surface water can be controlled by building dams or reservoirs. Now, in terms of pollution, surface water is very susceptible to pollution just because it exists at the surface. It can gather pollutants from basically anything that touches the water itself. That could include fecal coliform from the feces of humans and animals as well as solid waste coming from the waste of humans. Groundwater is more impervious to such pollutions compared to surface water. So groundwater can be very clean because it can be naturally purified through its percolation in the topsoil. And in some places, groundwater can be directly potable just by disinfection. In terms of the components or the usual pollutants in surface water and groundwater, surface water contains noticeable levels of suspended solids as well as dissolved organic substances depending on the source. That is because, again, it exists on the surface, 
So it is highly susceptible to the dissolution of organic substances coming from natural sources like leaves or twigs or wood. It can also have a lot of suspended solids depending on its contact with the soil or the sediment. On the other hand, groundwater contains noticeable levels of dissolved organic substances such as minerals because it is percolating through the soil. But normally it is low on suspended solids because the natural filtration offered by the soil removes those suspended solids. Okay? The number one problem with groundwater is it can be what we call hard water. Hard water is problematic in process plant piping as well as in basic day-to-day -day activities such as using soap because basically hard water inhibits bubbles from surfactants such as soaps. No? We will discuss that later. In terms of treatments, surface water normally requires the full conventional water treatment system because most of our surface water sources have already been exposed to humans and whenever humans are, pollution follows. For groundwater, depending on the source, treatments could be as simple as disinfection upon extraction and depending on the use, groundwater can also be softened. Softening of water means the removal of hardness. We will discuss all of those later. Okay? Now, if we are going to talk about water treatments, we have to first talk about water quality parameters. The water quality parameters are basically what allows us to classify if a water source is clean or not. Water quality parameters are divided into three as pictured here, that is physical, chemical, and biological parameters. Let's start with the physical parameters. Physical parameters include turbidity, dissolved and suspended solids or particles, color, taste and odor, and temperature. We will go through all of these parameters one by one, and I will discuss what do these parameters mean. Let's start with turbidity. Turbidity is the measure of the optical clarity of water. When we say the water has low turbidity, that means that it's clear. And if the water has a high turbidity, it means that we cannot see through the water, meaning there are lots of suspended particles in your water. If you take a look at this picture, we have here a scale from low turbidity to high turbidity. Turbidity is not normally a problem for drinking water because our potable water is required to have a very, very low turbidity. We measure turbidity using this device that we call a turbidity meter. And turbidity is reported in terms of NTU or nephelometric turbidity units. Okay? A higher number of turbidity might mean that the water is not fit for consumption. Next parameter, we have the dissolved and suspended solids. Suspended solids are in part tied to turbidity because if you have a lot of suspended solids, you also have a high turbidity. However, for dissolved and suspended solids, they are grouped together because they are lumped as a parameter that's known as total solids. The total solids is the sum of the total dissolved solids and the total suspended solids. The total suspended solids are divided into two, that is the colloidal solids and the settleable solids. Basically, when we are measuring the amount of solids in a water sample, it is a measure of the number and size of particles in water. Colloidal particles are very, very small and they cannot be settled by gravity. Those particles could indicate levels of dissolved organic and inorganic matter, or suspended solids and microorganisms. It is not just soil or sand that gets suspended in the water column. Suspended solids could also include bacteria, algae, or colonies of bacteria in the water column. The total dissolved solids could either be of organic or inorganic origin. No? For inorganic origin, we have the minerals. Hardness is actually part of total dissolved solids. And for those of organic origin, we have substances such as tannins and other dissolved substances of plant and animal origin. Here we have a correlation between the total dissolved solids and electrolytic conductivity. If you will recall, electrolytic conductivity is the measure of the resistance of water to the flow of electrons. A high value of the electrolytic conductivity means that there are a lot of ionic substances dissolved in the water that aids the flow of electrons through the water. While a low electrolytic conductivity means that there are very few total dissolved solids. If you take a look at this correlation between TDS and conductivity, the higher the conductivity, the higher the total dissolved solids. For total dissolved solids, we usually use a device which we call a TDS meter. These kinds of TDS meter actually just measure electrolytic conductivity and they convert it into TDS using this correlation. The next parameter we have is color. Color, as you might have known, is simply the color of the water. However, we have two types of color in water. We have the apparent color and the true color. 
the apparent color is what is usually seen by the naked eye because this is due to suspended particles in the water column. For example, in this figure above, if there are algae suspended in the water column, the water appears to be green. While for true color, this is due to dissolved substances. Normally, these are metal ions such as iron and manganese which gives a rusty color to the water. Or it could also be of organic origin such as in this figure, the water turns red or light brown because of tannins coming from the decay of wood and dried leaves. Always remember that color is imparted by dissolved organic substances or suspended particles. Now, color itself is not dangerous if it is in water. What's dangerous is what is imparting the color in the water. It could be the case that there is an excess of iron or manganese ions in the water column, which is bad for our health. And it could also be the case that there are suspended bacteria or algae in the water column, such as in the figure above. So color in the water is not good because of aesthetics, but also because of the health risks coming from those that are imparting the color. Next physical parameters, we have taste and odor. Now, I have lumped both parameters together because they can be very subjective. Subjective in the case that the taste and odor of a water sample could be different from person to person because we have different perceptions of what is smelly and what tastes good or what does not taste good. Okay? Examples of common odors include chlorine coming from the residuals of disinfection from water treatment and a musty odor coming from decaying organic matter, usually coming from natural sources such as river water. On the other hand, examples of common tastes include metallic, if you can taste the metallic substances in water that is commonly due to some dissolved minerals. You can also taste chlorine from the water as a residual of disinfection. And sometimes you can classify the taste as overall objectionable taste, meaning we are perceiving the water sample to not be potable because of an objectionable taste. Next parameter, we have temperature. Temperature is a very important physical parameter of water because it affects several other parameters such as density, viscosity, electrolytic conductivity, vapor pressure, solubility, and the reaction rates that are very important in water treatment. Okay? We normally measure the temperature when obtaining a sample of water because again, it affects all of the other properties of water. Next, we now go to the chemical parameters of water. We have hardness, pH and alkalinity, dissolved oxygen, BOD or COD, nitrogen and phosphorus, heavy metals, and miscellaneous dissolved substances. Now, in reality, there are lots of chemical parameters for water because there are also a lot of substances that can be dissolved in water. But we will just be focusing on the most important. Let's start with hardness. Hardness, as I have mentioned earlier, is a big problem in groundwater. Hardness is caused by dissolved minerals, largely calcium and magnesium ions in combination with carbonates, bicarbonates, chloride, and sulfates and ions. We have two types of hardness. We have temporary hardness and permanent hardness. Temporary hardness can be resolved in as simple as boiling your water source. That's because you are precipitating the calcium and magnesium ions in the form of carbonates. And you can also remove temporary hardness by placing a precipitating agent such as soda ash or sodium carbonate. On the other hand, we also have permanent hardness in which the calcium and magnesium ions are paired with chloride or sulfate. If it is in this form, you cannot precipitate the calcium and magnesium ions in water. What we can do is we can pass the water through an ion exchange column in which we simply swap out the calcium and magnesium ions in favor of sodium ions because sodium does not impart hardness in water. The problem with that is you have replaced calcium with sodium and sodium could have negative effects especially in some people with hypertension. Okay? You can see with this figure at the top, one of the negative effects of hardness is it can precipitate its minerals in surfaces such as in the inside of pipes. And lime scales can occur in process piping, in household pipings, as well as in boilers or some heaters. So this is a very destructive and negative effect of hardness on piping. Another effect of hardness that you may have already noticed is that when you are washing your hands with soap using hard water, you may find it difficult to build up a lather using the soap because the calcium and magnesium ions react with the stearates in the soap to produce calcium and magnesium stearates which are insoluble in water. And the calcium or magnesium stearate that precipitates here is what manifests to us as soap scum. Okay? So it is unsightly and it can affect the lathering potential of soap and detergents. Next chemical parameter we have is pH. So by this point, you have to be familiar with pH already. 
The pH is the measure of the proton ion concentration in water. Basically, the higher the proton concentration, the lower the pH. The pH of water affects many aspects of the water treatment process from piping to equipment to the chemical reactions. If your water is acidic, over time it can leach out metal ions from your piping such as this one. It can corrode the process piping and it can also damage equipment. However, if your pH is too high, it can still corrode your process piping because high pH in water could induce the solubilization of some of the materials used in piping. In water treatments, the ideal pH is neutral or very near neutral. pH should never be confused with alkalinity. When we say alkalinity, that is a very different parameter in water treatment. Alkalinity contains a unit whereas pH does not have a unit. Okay? Alkalinity is expressed as milli equivalents per liter or the equivalent amount of monoprotic acid such as HCl that will be used to neutralize the water sample. And alkalinity is determined by titration. So we take a water sample and we simply titrate it with a strong monoprotic acid such as HCl to determine how much of the dissolved solids can neutralize the acid. Alkalinity reflects the ability of a water sample to resist large changes in pH which is important in large bodies of water hosting aquatic life. A famous example of this is the ocean, which contains a lot of alkalinity, and the alkalinity in the ocean buffers the pH of the water such that all living creatures in the oceans would not experience a drastic increase or decrease in pH, which would be very, very dangerous to aquatic life. Always remember that alkalinity is the capability of a water sample to buffer changes in pH. Next, we have dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen, as the name implies, is the amount of oxygen dissolved in water. The dissolved oxygen parameter is much more important in wastewater treatments compared to water treatments because in wastewater treatments, the dissolved oxygen is used by microorganisms to purify the water. In water treatments, what the dissolved oxygen tells us is if this body of water can be inhabited by aquatic creatures. Dissolved oxygen plays a vital role in the natural ability of bodies of water to self-purify. If you notice, stagnant bodies of water would often be very dirty because they don't have the capacity to self-purify because they are not flowing and therefore they cannot replenish the dissolved oxygen that is being utilized by microorganisms to clean the water. If you find a water source that is freely flowing such as a fast-flowing river, you would often see that the water is clean except for those that are artificially polluted. Microorganisms responsible for breaking down organic load in water often need oxygen, meaning they are aerobic organisms. So for them to consume the organic load in the water that makes the water dirty, they need oxygen to process those organic matter. Okay? The dissolved oxygen concentration in water is very limited by temperature because of equilibrium. The principle at play here is Henry's law, wherein the concentration of a dissolved gas in a liquid is directly proportional to its partial pressure in the atmosphere. At 30 degrees Celsius, the maximum dissolved oxygen concentration is around 8.24 milligrams per liter, and this value goes down as you further increase the temperature because dissolved oxygen concentration is inversely proportional to temperature. As you will imagine, as it gets hotter and hotter, there would be less and less dissolved oxygen in water. That's why aquatic organisms are very much at risk of being deprived of dissolved oxygen as our planet becomes warmer and warmer. Okay? You see in this chart the range of tolerance for dissolved oxygen in fish. The rule of thumb is we have to keep the dissolved oxygen concentration at least 5 ppm because below 5 ppm of dissolved oxygen concentration, fishes would start to feel the effects of oxygen stress in their body. So generally, we want to keep the dissolved oxygen concentration from 5 to 9 ppm in natural bodies of water so that the body of water can purify itself and it can also continue to support aquatic life. The next two parameters are linked to dissolved oxygen and as with dissolved oxygen, they are much more important in wastewater treatments compared to water treatments. We have here the biochemical oxygen demand or what we call as BOD. The BOD refers to the amount of dissolved oxygen in parts per million or in milligrams per liter that microorganisms need to degrade the dissolved organic matter in water. So the BOD is actually a measure of how clean a water source is or not. Okay? A high BOD value translates to high amount of dissolved organic material. It would not surprise you that this parameter is much more important in wastewater treatments with ranges of BOD at around 100 or more compared to water treatments wherein we mostly encounter BOD values of 10 or less. Okay? 
So when we discuss wastewater treatments, we will go back to biochemical oxygen demand. Next is the chemical oxygen demand. So this is a related parameter to the biochemical oxygen demand in such a way that they are measuring the same stuff in water. A high value of COD would also imply that the water is dirty or it has a lot of dissolved organic substances. Okay? However, in contrast with the BOD, the COD refers to the equivalent amount of oxygen in ppm from a strong oxidizing agent to oxidize dissolved substances in water. So if the BOD relies on bacterial action to determine how much oxygen does the bacteria need to oxidize dissolved organic substances in water, in COD, we are using a strong oxidizing agent. So it would not surprise you that the COD determination is faster compared to the BOD because basically the determination of microbial action needed in BOD is very slow compared to the chemical oxidation in COD. We commonly use potassium dichromates as the oxidant. Therefore, it can oxidize both organic and inorganic species in solution. In almost all of the cases, the COD or the chemical oxygen demand is higher than the value of the BOD for the same water sample. That's because the potassium dichromates or any other strong oxidant used in the determination of COD is much more efficient in oxidizing both organic and inorganic substances in water compared to bacteria. Again, we will go back to the concept of BOD and COD when we are discussing wastewater treatment. Next, we have nutrients. Nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus are another parameters that we have to be concerned about in our water sources because they could be the cause of what we call eutrophication. As starters, we already know that nitrogen and phosphorus are major nutrients that enable the growth of plants. In fact, they are major constituents of fertilizer. Okay? However, when they are present in excess quantities in bodies of water, nutrients can cause eutrophication or the rapid growth of algae, often leading to the suffocation of aquatic life. Since nitrogen and phosphorus are nutrients for plants and other autotrophic species, they could trigger the very fast growth of algae. And if you have a very fast growth of algae, we call that eutrophication and it's a very big threat to aquatic life because literally dense mats of algae can block sunlight and it can also prevent the water from naturally replenishing its dissolved oxygen, leading to the suffocation of aquatic life. Okay, But you might be wondering, aren't algae photosynthetic and therefore they can produce oxygen? Yes, you are correct in that they can produce oxygen in the day when they are photosynthesizing. However, in the dark or at night when they are respiring, they are actually using the oxygen from the water to utilize their stored carbohydrates. Okay, so the brief answer is yes, they are producing some oxygen, but then they are also using that oxygen or they might be even competing for oxygen with other aquatic life during their respiration. Nitrogen in the water can be present as ammonium or ammonia, nitrites or nitrates. Free ammonia and nitrite are highly toxic with concentrations of as little as 0.5 ppm and the most sensitive to this ammonia and nitrites concentrations are the fishes. When the ammonia and nitrite are converted to nitrates, it becomes relatively safe but elevated concentrations of nitrates such as higher than 100 ppm could still be detrimental to fishes. Next, we have phosphorus. It's mainly present in water as the inorganic phosphates ion, or it can also be present as organic phosphorus. Phosphorus is much more potent compared to nitrogen in triggering eutrophication events. Common sources of phosphorus include our laundry wastewater because some detergents contain phosphorus. Phosphorus can also come from human and animal manure, such as coming from untreated sewage. This is what eutrophication looks like. So you see in this upper picture that we have a river that is being choked by the growth of algae. These eutrophication events are fairly common in bodies of water that are near urban settings. That's because the common triggers to eutrophication include the discharge of excess fertilizer runoff coming from agriculture, untreated poultry or livestock wastewater, and untreated sewage or untreated human waste. So if we want to prevent eutrophication, we need to prevent these triggers to be discharged from our bodies of water. And last on the list, we have biological parameters. Biological parameters mainly focus on the living microorganisms in our water. That includes microbial count with the subsets of total coliform, fecal coliform, and E. coli count, as well as algae and phytoplankton. For microbial counts, it can be expressed in different terms such as total coliform, fecal coliform, or E. coli count. 
and these measures are of increasing specificity. What we mean by that is the measure of E. coli is included in the measure of fecal coliform, and the measure of fecal coliform is included in the measure of total coliform. So the choice of testing between total and fecal coliform would depend on the application of the water being tested. So what are coliform bacteria? Coliform bacteria are microorganisms that are common in human and animal manure and in the soil. We have natural coliform bacteria in our digestive system, which are expelled when we defecate, but there are also coliform bacteria present in soil. In contrast, fecal coliform are specifically bacteria present in the digestive tract of humans and animals. Fecal coliform in water could indicate a recent episode of manure being discharged in water. Okay, So fecal coliform is a much more specific bacterial count compared to total coliform. And finally, E. coli is a specific bacterial species that is included in the fecal coliform count. However, it is important to note that not all strains of E. coli are pathogenic or can cause disease. When we measure E. coli, we are measuring all of the strains. And if you want to measure the presence of just one particular strain, there are more specialized tests available. But for general purposes, we normally don't need to measure the specific strains of E. coli. Sometimes it would be better if you just count the total fecal coliform or even the total coliform. These images show us how do we measure microbial counts in water. So we have several methods that we can use. However, what we have here are the two most used methods. The first is the multiple tubes method pictured here. This is expressed as the most probable number or MPN per ml or per 100 ml. In the multiple tubes method, what we are doing is we are inoculating several tubes with the same sample water at increasing dilution ratio. And the presence of bacterial growth on some tubes after indication would indicate the relative concentration of bacteria on the original water sample. So statistics has something to do with the computation of the most probable number for the multiple tubes method. A more direct way of counting bacteria is what we call the poor plate method, wherein you simply inoculate a nutritive agar media with the sample at different dilutions. So you see here at the largest dilution, 1 is to 100,000, you can see that the coliform forming units here are countable. Coliform forming units are simply masses of bacteria that are clumped together and are growing together. In this method, we simply count the number of coliform forming units and we express that as coliform forming units per ml or per 100 ml of the sample. Next, we have the measure of algae and phytoplankton. Now, the measurement of algae and phytoplankton concentration in water is not always used to assess water quality because these are only applicable for raw water sources, okay? We do not use this for our treated water. However, when the application calls for the measurements, we don't directly measure the concentration of algae cells in water. What we measure instead is the chlorophyll concentration in water using spectrophotometric analysis. Because the chlorophyll concentration in water is directly proportional to the concentration of algae and phytoplankton in water. You may take a quick break before we proceed to the discussion of water treatment. Welcome back to the discussion and as we have already finished discussing the different water quality parameters, we are now ready to discuss the entire water treatment process. So just a quick background, it is the water treatment system that transforms surface water coming from rivers or lakes to the potable water that comes out of your faucets. Yes, you heard me right. The water coming out of your faucet treated by your water concessionaire is potable. That's because the water coming out of your faucet should adhere to the Philippine National Standard for drinking water, which we will discuss later. So how do we transform lake or river water into potable drinking water? Given here is the schematic for the conventional water treatment system. So you have your influent surface water. It goes through screening to remove most of the large debris such as leaves, sand, and twigs. It then undergoes pH control to bring its pH as close to 7 as possible. Then it goes through a pre-disinfection or a pre-oxidation process that reduces the microbial load of the water. Then it enters the coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation trio of the treatment, which is arguably the heart of the treatment process. And it passes through a filter to remove some of the residual particles that might have been missed by the sedimentation. And finally, the clear water goes through disinfection to make sure that there are no harmful pathogens that are in the water before it is stored and distributed. That is a brief description of the entire water treatment system. In the next few slides, we will be discussing each of these steps in detail. Let's start with pH control. 
It is ideal that the pH of the water is as close to 7 as possible before the treatment starts because low pH values may affect the coagulation flocculation process which we will discuss later and may corrode pipes and tanks while high pH values have basically the same effect. Okay, So too high and too low of a pH are both detrimental to the water treatment process. pH control and stabilization is achieved by adding either acetic acid, hydrochloric acid, or other suitable acids if the pH is too high. And if the pH is too low, we can add sodium hydroxide or most preferably sodium carbonate. Pre-chlorination can also be done if the water source is high in organic load because high organic load would be problematic in the later steps of the treatment. Pre-chlorination also enhances coagulation and flocculation because it reduces the microbial load of the incoming water. Pre-chlorination also ensures that your piping and your equipment will not develop biofilms which can be harmful to the treatment process. After pH control and pre-chlorination, we have the process of coagulation. Now, coagulation is part of the trio that is responsible for the actual cleaning of the water in the water treatment process. The most important part of coagulation is that you do not confuse it with flocculation. Okay? Coagulation and flocculation are two different processes, but they are often lumped into one process, which is the coagulation-flocculation process. Shown in this figure here is what happens upon adding of the coagulant. Upon addition of the coagulant in water, it solubilizes and attracts suspended impurities which clumps together so that it can be removed easily. Commonly used coagulants include the following. We have alum or aluminum sulfates. We have ferric chloride or ferric sulfates, polyaluminum chloride, other synthetic organic polymers, some of which are proprietary. And some treatment plants are now opting to use plant-based coagulants such as those extracted from the seeds of Moringa oleifera or malungai. Because the resulting sludge from the coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation process would then be biodegradable. After the addition of the coagulant in coagulation, it's now time for flocculation. So flocculation is basically the continuation of coagulation. In coagulation, the little colloidal particles have started to clump together, but it is in flocculation that they begin to form large masses that we call flocks. The formation of flocks in this step is very important because the larger flocks are easier and more efficient to remove than the smaller colloidal particles before coagulation and flocculation. Here is an example of what happens in flocculation. So one of the key ingredients in the operation of flocculation tanks is movement because the movement of water either by steering or by movement in tanks with baffles is it encourages the smaller flocks to join with bigger flocks such that we form larger and larger aggregates of the impurities. Okay, This is an example of a flocculation tank. If you see here, the coagulation happens in this part here wherein the coagulant solution is being dosed and pumped into the incoming water. Upon mixing of the coagulant solution, the flow of the water through this tank with baffles ensures that the contact time is large and it also ensures that we are forming large flocks which can naturally settle by gravity. Here's an example of a single unit that integrates coagulation, flocculation, and clarification or sedimentation. As you may have noticed, this is a conical tank and conical tanks are perfect for this job because they can concentrate the sludge at the bottom which can be retrieved without disturbing the clear water that is being withdrawn at the top. So we start here at number 2. This is where the coagulant is being dosed and upon contact of the coagulants with the water, it starts to gather the impurities. Now the flocculation itself happens in the tank because the red part here is the stirrer. It slowly steers the solution to promote the formation of larger and larger flux. Now when the flux are large enough, they are encouraged to freely settle down due to gravity and this is where clarification enters. Since the larger flux are settled by gravity, and the pointed portion of the conical tank is where the sludge is encouraged to settle, where it can be easily separated from the clear water. The outlet of the clear water here, number 5, is what then moves on to the next process. Okay, That's why we normally see coagulation, flocculation, and clarification or sedimentation in the same unit. However, we can also place a separate sedimentation tank, which serves the purpose of removing the particles that might have been missed by the clarifier. A sedimentation tank is designed to settle large particles that could have escaped the previous clarification. There are some instances wherein a sedimentation tank is no longer required if you already have the tree of coagulation, flocculation, and clarification in the same tank. But the sedimentation tank performs the same function as the clarifier. The main purpose is for the sludge to settle at the bottom and for clear water and for clear water to be decanted at the top.
Now, after clarification and sedimentation, we now have filtration. The filtration is called a polishing step because it ensures the removal of most suspended particles. So we are making sure that the water is as pure as possible. Okay? One of the most commonly used units for this process is called an RSF or a rapid sand filter. A rapid sand filter is simply a large cartridge or a large container containing layers of sand and gravel along with other granulated materials such as granulated activated carbon. The purpose of this filtration is to polish the water to make sure that it is clear and is rid of every noticeable particle. And the inclusion of activated carbon into the rapid sand filter also ensures that we can absorb some of the organic substances that might not have been removed by the water. Okay? The granular activated carbon that is being placed in some rapid sand filters could also be important especially if you are performing a pre-chlorination step at the top of the process because remember, the disinfection of the water containing organic materials could lead to some byproducts. And the granular activated carbon present in the rapid sand filter ensures that we capture most, if not all, of those byproducts. Okay? After filtration, we have reached the end of the process and that is disinfection. Disinfection is a very important process in the water treatment paradigm because it ensures that the effluent water from the water treatment system is rid of pathogens that could induce diseases to those who then drink the water. Disinfection is normally done in these kinds of tanks. If you take a look at this picture here, this is simply a tank wherein the water is encouraged to take its time in traveling inside of the tank because of the baffles placed in the tank. The baffles here serve its purpose of increasing the hydraulic retention time of the water inside of the tank while the gas diffuser bubblers here ensure that there is intimate contact between the gaseous disinfectants and the water. Some of our most commonly used disinfectants include the following. We have chlorine gas, ozone gas, chloramine which is also a gas. This is a product when mixing ammonia and chlorine gas. We can also use chlorine dioxide and UVC radiation. Ultraviolet radiation is the only non-chemical technique that is being used in disinfection. Okay? Now, you might be asking, why do we have different types of disinfectants to carry out the same purpose of killing harmful microorganisms in water? That's because different disinfectants have different effectivities toward different microorganisms. This shows you the concentration and time product that is required for a specific microorganism to be killed or to be inactivated by different disinfectants. The lower the value of the product, the better. So you can see in this chart that ozone gets lower values of CT for some of the most common waterborne disease-causing bacteria and viruses, while chloramines need either a larger concentration or a longer contact time before they can be effective in removing some of these microorganisms. Now, ozone is very effective in disinfection. However, it is very difficult to handle. So in some cases wherein they are using ozone for disinfection, they are generating it on-site. You can also see here that UV light requires a specific window for concentration times time or in the case of UV light that is light intensity times time to destroy some of these microorganisms. Now the problem with conventional disinfection is the formation of disinfection by products. Disinfection by products are classified as an emerging public health risk because some of these byproducts can cause cancer in humans. Some of the common disinfection by products produced in the conventional water treatment process include trihalomethanes from using chlorine gas, nitrosodimethylamine or NDMA from using chloramine, chloride and chlorate ions from chlorine dioxide, and bromate from ozone. Bromate is a known carcinogen and it is often present when groundwater is treated with ozone because bromide ions are relatively common in groundwater and in saline wells. And that is why the use of granular activated carbon filters after disinfection is a good idea because it can filter out and it can absorb some of this harmful disinfection byproducts. As a summary, this is the entire water treatment schematic diagram coming from the influent water which is coming from a lake up to the pre-distribution storage in reservoirs. So we have the influence undergoing primary treatment from screens, undergoing pre-chlorination, and then injection of chemical coagulants, and then flocculation, sedimentation, rapid sand filtration, post-chlorination for disinfection and storage. Now, we do have alternatives to the conventional water treatment system because as our technology progresses, we are able to develop technologies that are more efficient and more effective in treating water. One of such technologies is membrane filtration technology. It is more efficient, saves more space, and uses less energy than the conventional water treatment system. 
One of the biggest downside is it can present a large capital cost if you're establishing a membrane filtration water treatment facility. That's because the membrane itself is very expensive to produce. However, we do have different types of membranes ranging from relatively large pores in microfiltration up to the virtually non-porous membranes of reverse osmosis. Now, their main difference lies, again, in the size of their pores such that they can filter different types of particles. Microfiltration filters have pore sizes ranging from a few micrometers and they can filter out particles, sediment, algae, protozoa, and bacteria. However, they cannot filter out small colloids and viruses. That's why for that purpose, we have ultrafiltration with pore sizes ranging from hundreds of nanometers. However, ultrafiltration cannot remove dissolved substances. So if you are looking to remove dissolved substances, we turn to nanofiltration, which has pore sizes in the order of tens of nanometers. They can already remove the big molecules of dissolved organic matter, as well as some divalent ions such as calcium and magnesium. Reverse osmosis is a membrane filtration technology which removes virtually all dissolved substances in water. It only lets water pass through because the membrane used in reverse osmosis is virtually non-porous. Okay? However, the drawback of using a membrane filter with smaller and smaller pores is that you are expending more and more energy to let the water pass through. That's what we call the transmembrane pressure. The transmembrane pressure increases as the pore size decreases. So you can imagine that the pressure used in reverse osmosis is very, very high compared to that of microfiltration. That is why reverse osmosis is still a costly process even though it can be used to desalinate salt water. This is an example of a reverse osmosis facility. This is located in the island of Cebu. So the feed to this process is brackish groundwater. It then passes through hollow fiber reverse osmosis membrane filters which are the white cartridges that you can see here, okay? The output to this process is already fresh water with very low levels of total dissolved solids and salinity. However, in these types of technology, sometimes pretreatment is needed to prevent the fast fouling of the reverse osmosis membrane. Pretreatment could involve another filtration process such as ultrafiltration or the conventional coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation. In that way, you are reducing the amount of particles that has to be strained by the filter. Another integral part of the water treatment paradigm is the sludge handling because virtually almost every step of the process in the conventional water treatment system and even in membrane treatment processes, we are generating sludge. Sludge is the collective term for the solid waste of the process. It can include particles of varying sizes and it can also include the coagulant used in the process along with other suspended solids. It is important to note that water treatment produces way less sludge compared to wastewater treatment. So sludge handling is normally not a problem with water treatment systems because the sludge can simply be dewatered, meaning we remove the water by either drying or filtration, and the dewatered sludge is simply disposed in landfills. The water treatment process virtually stops at the sludge handling stage because after that, the treated water would then be distributed through the pipelines. And now you know the tedious process of treating surface water in order for it to be fit for human consumption. So the next time you open your faucet or take a shower, think of the entire water treatment system and think of all of the steps that water has to go through before it can be used for our consumption. Let us now go to the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. I have mentioned earlier that the water coming out of your faucet, treated by your concessionaires, is supposed to be potable water. That's because the effluent of a water treatment system has to adhere with the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. The latest version of this document is released by the Department of Health as the DOH Administrative Order No. 2017-10. This sets the guidelines for the maximum permissible amounts of impurities in drinking water. Here are some of the parameters that I have taken from the Philippine National Standard for Drinking Water along with the maximum allowable level. These are some of the parameters that we have discussed earlier regarding water quality. First in the list is taste and odor and both should have no objectionable taste or odor. These are based on the complaints of the customer. Next we have apparent color which has a maximum allowable level of 10 color units. Turbidity, 5 nephelometric turbidity units. Total hardness, 300 ppm. pH should be in the range of 6.5 to 8.5. Total dissolved solids should not exceed 600 ppm or milligrams per liter. Nitrate in water should not exceed 50 milligrams per liter. 
The thermotolerant coliform count measured by the multiple tube fermentation technique should be less than 1.1, most probable number per 100 ml of water sample. The residual chlorine should range between 0.3 ppm minimum and 1.5 ppm maximum. That's because the water in our pipelines should still carry a residual amount of chlorine in order to prevent bacterial outbreaks. And finally, we have the three required heavy metals to be monitored in water, arsenic, cadmium, and lead. They are not to exceed this written allowable levels. The entries here with the asterisks are the required parameters that should be tested for level 2 and level 3 facilities. Level 2 facilities are communal faucets servicing several families, while level 3 facilities are water concessionaires such as Mainilad and Manila Water. And with that, I refer to you to our further reading for this lesson. I want you to obtain a copy of the Philippine National Standard for Drinking Water of 2017 and read its entire contents. The table that I presented to you earlier is just a small portion of the large list of substances that are being regulated in our water. In the document, there are also regulations for water refilling businesses, including their frequency of water testing. And also, there is a list of maximum allowable levels for pesticide residuals as well as disinfection byproducts. Reading the copy of the PNSDW 2017 would give you a better understanding of what goes into maintaining the quality of our drinking water. Okay, that's the end of this lesson. I hope that you have a newfound appreciation of the water coming out of your faucet through understanding the water treatment process. Always stay curious and as always, keep safe. Thank <laughs> you.